Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to present today on uh, clinical trial simulation in the geriatric population. Uh, I should mention that uh, the views expressed today are um, my opinions and not necessarily the reflective views of uh, IQVIA. All right. So the goal of uh, clinical trial simulation is to optimize the clinical trial design. And the way we go about this is to look at uh, many of the elements that influence the scientific outcomes uh, of a clinical trial. Uh, the first is to look at the different types of um, uh, protocol design. Uh, we also need to generate uh, elderly patients uh, for our simulations. And uh, we'll go through a little bit on how we do that and then how uh, that uh, uh, to apply in essence like your inclusion exclusion criteria and how that impacts uh, the uh, clinical trial results. Um, We'll also uh, spend a bit of time talking about the drug model um, and, uh, and clinical, uh, especially in key kind of like clinical trial simulations. As we can see in the figure, the PK model um, really ends up driving a lot of like the uh, PD and biomarkers, clinical outcomes, adverse events, et cetera. Uh, but then these effects also drive further downstream and feedback events like dropouts and adherence. And uh, so when we're performing a clinical trial simulation, it's especially important to um, look at this and uh, especially important uh, in, the, in the elderly population, as we'll discuss shortly. <clears throat> now, the um, uh, clinical trial simulations uh, will then go on uh, to evaluate uh, the planned analysis uh, results and various scenarios, uh, replets, et cetera, uh, to further optimize like the, the protocol uh, so that you're hopefully going to have a, a successful uh, study. For clinical trial simulations, we do have to generate um, our, our, quote, virtual um, elderly patients, for example. And uh, while we can do this by uh, sampling from a multivariate distribution or whatnot, uh, that method often has very many limitations uh, in generating reasonable patients. And so what we tend to like to do is to go out and to sample um, um, patients from uh, existing databases, uh, some <coughs> of the general databases we may pull from, maybe like the NHANES, NHANS, or um, NSHAP. And then depending upon like the clinical trial endpoints, <clears throat> uh, additional therapeutic area uh, specific databases may also be used. And um, these can you know, be pulled from um, uh, applying for access to data from uh, the different NIH institutes uh, to the Critical Path Institute, pharma companies, or even um, association patient repositories uh, that, that are also out there. Um, so the, <clears throat> an additional element to uh, creating uh, the virtual patient is also uh, to develop a, the disease progression model uh, that informs each, each patient's uh, disease attribute that, that changes out over time. And this is important in the elderly population uh, because when we think about the elderly population, they're often at the right side on those models where the disease progression is actually having greater changes uh, out over time. So with that, I would... Um, add a, a quick plug for the, the some of the disease progression models that are out there, uh, especially like with the Critical Path Institute and some of their um, programs, uh, for like the Parkinson's disease progression model that they're um, uh, using, as well as like the Alzheimer's disease. These types of um, um, models uh, are, are definitely a fundamental element to uh, performing a clinical trial simulation. Uh, especially in the um, elderly population. So I won't belabor the details of the uh, drug model uh, given Dr. Friedrich's prior presentation, uh, but suffice to say uh, the incorporation of the PK and or PD uh, model as a principal component of a clinical trial simulation. There are various levels of complexity in what these models uh, look like as um, uh, uh, she went through. Uh, but the primary rationale for incorporating a population PK uh, and or PD model into a clinical trial simulation goes one step further in that we're 
wanting to use the covariates to explain and really to drive uh, those potential sources of variability and understand what the, the impact that that, that that has on a uh, uh, simulation scenario. So this is where many of the age-related changes that um, um, especially Dr. Kukul mentioned earlier today tie in and then have the corresponding MPK and PD implications. Um, so with like the GI system, uh, body composition, uh, and the, the issues that we have there and how that affects like absorption and distribution. Um, likewise in the um, elderly population, we know that there are differences um, uh, and changes that occur uh, in metabolism and elimination. And so uh, if you're going to uh, perform a clinical trial simulation in the elderly, we have to you know, also um, include those uh, as an aspect of, of the model. One of the biggest challenges in clinical trials uh, and, and really even in clinical practice is the issue of adherence. And uh, this is particularly true in the elderly population. If we think about like John Urquhart and his rule of sixes in which uh, the six of the patients are completely compliant uh, on, a, on a given medication and uh, six never take the drug and everybody else is kind of in between. Uh, we know that that's a, a big issue just in the general population, but this is especially true uh, in the elderly uh, where um, a medication adherence is actually you know, fairly across the board, fairly low and uh, closely correlated with um, education level uh, significance of health-related problems, dosing frequency, and uh, to a certain degree, also the, the whole polypharmacy uh, issue. So we need to take adherence into account when we're performing clinical trial simulations. And um, the, the significance of not accounting for adherence um, uh, can play a big role in, in how um, uh, some of the outcomes that we observe both in the uh, virtual uh, simulations, uh, clinical trial simulations, but also in the real world uh, settings. And that like if we have adherence holidays, uh, these can drop concentration levels uh, below a threshold for uh, therapeutic efficacy. But we can also have uh, non-compliance, uh, double dosing, et cetera. They can also push levels above and, um, and into a toxicity uh, range, potentially leading to um, uh, adverse events. So this can be issues. Um, and then we also have, um, I think, a, a challenge within the elderly population as far as um, uh, the idea of trying to balance what the best dosing regimen might be, uh, because we can have you know more frequent dosing uh, that provides better forgiveness for missed doses, but it can actually lead to more skip doses where uh, on the flip side, uh, if we have daily dosing uh, that might be more convenient, but at the cost of being less forgiving uh, on missed doses. So also aspects of um, trying to run clinical trial simulations in the elderly population. Now, uh, Sorry. Briefly wanted to also add that once we have all the elements assembled for the clinical trial simulation, uh, we can run those and um, the various scenarios and replicates, uh, we can evaluate and look at the, the corresponding results. Uh, the case study that I'm presenting here shows some results from a set of clinical trial simulations uh, that we performed uh, related to the assessment of Pripercell and Tazel Bactam in assessing the probability of uh, target attainment of um, uh, MICs and um, uh, in this sense, like once the, the primary questions uh, related to the potential dosing adjustment uh, in, the, in the obese population and trying to account for uh, differences in renal function along with different uh, dosing or infusion regimens. Um, in this specific example, we were able to demonstrate uh, that no weight-based um, uh, dosing adjustments were necessary in the obese population, uh, but it did validate the use of it, like extended infusion regimens uh, for both the normal and obese populations. And a lot of that came through um, tying a bunch of like these different elements together uh, to run the uh, uh, clinical trial simulation. 
And one additional item I wanted to uh, touch base on uh, was uh, precision dosing. Um, and these applications and their integration within clinical trial simulations and really as tools to, to improve the ability uh, to individualize dosing and how they can be beneficial uh, to patients and in this case, definitely the, the elderly population. Uh, these, uh, and they're often mobile applications allow us to optimize uh, patient exposures and um, you know, obviously then the corresponding efficacy and safety response. Uh, they're often used for uh, drugs with um, narrow therapeutic indices, but we've also seen a lot of interest, especially of late, uh, with them uh, in patient populations outside the, the normal um, um, the population, looking at like pediatric uh, transplant, uh, if we have renal, hepatic, immune impairment, impairment populations. They also very uh, keyed in uh, on, on precision dosing. Now the tools use both an empiric based estimate as well as a Bayesian updates to, to provide both dosing predictions as well as the ability to learn and update the models uh, in real time. I think they really have the potential to move um, uh, the idea of a, a randomized dose controlled uh, clinical trial forward uh, to look more at like concentration or biomarker uh, controlled clinical trials uh, to help reduce some of the down bias um, uh, especially for trials uh, where we have confounding overlap uh, for molecules that uh, exhibit high PK variability. And they can also be used to, to help uh, reduce sample size. So these types of tools, I think, also have uh, very much like a real world practical use and then they can connect with um, uh, a lot of the electronic medical records um, as well as wearables, other sensors, so that the, the healthcare providers and, and patients uh, can be better informed on uh, dosing and adherence uh, related issues. So I think there's a huge opportunity here and um, um, especially when we start looking at like machine learning and polypharmacy and really trying to better understand, you know, the drug, 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 drug type interaction uh, uh, issues uh, that we have in the elderly population. I think uh, this could be a uh, very viable tool moving forward. So with that, um, I will conclude my uh, presentation and I appreciate your, your time. Thank you.